Uh, so I don't love reading off uh, bio lists, so I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves, and then we'll hop into the discussion. Um, so good morning, everybody. I'm Brenna Berman. I'm the executive director of an urban innovation organization called the City Tech Collaborative, and we bring together cities, um, organ corporations, large and small, academic organizations, um, and nonprofits to build urban solutions. Hi, my name is Gerber Rondbuk for the City of Amsterdam as their Chief Technology Innovation Officer. I'm Miguel Gamino. I am the Executive Vice President of Global Cities for MasterCard, recently announced yesterday. Um, previously, the Chief Technology Officer for this great city of New York, and before that, CIO of San Francisco and several other things before that. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jan Vapavri. I'm the Mayor of the City of Helsinki, Finland, which is the most functional city in the world, which is the, the topic of our strategy. I know it maybe do not sound that sexy, but I think it's relevant. In an unstable world, which we are witnessing at the time being, I think it may even become luxury that you have cities and places which are predictable, safe, and very functional. Yeah, so I wanted to start off with a framing question, which is, what does it mean for cities to work together? Uh, you know, obviously we live in a very connected world at the moment. However, cities all have their own rules, they have their own cultures. Um, what does it mean for cities to innovate globally? Um, I want to start with Jan here because we had a great discussion beforehand. Um, what role can cities play in solving not only problems for their residents but for the world? I think that we're actually witnessing a air round um, um, rise of, of the cities globally, which has been quite evident already for some time. Of course, the urbanization megatrend itself means that it's more people living in cities. Then we have witnessed that the national states have been not that good in solving global problems. I think it's especially evident here in the states, and the cities take their role. And then what I think is, is maybe even more important, which we have forgotten every now and then, is that the cities, they have a dialogue with the city sense the nation states can't have in that sense. Uh, it was quite natural maybe for after the First World War that nation states found uh, themselves creating different kind of networks in order to cooperate, in, in order to share be be best practices. And, and of course, they had some other goals as well. And in today's world, where the disruption is, is as strong as it is, uh, where the, the technology changes the world in a more and more rapid phase. I think now is the time when cities understand that they have a leading role and they can't really have it and execute it if they don't partner with other cities. Yeah, uh, Miguel, you were just CTO of New York City and recently left to join the private sector. Uh, what can you do in the private sector to connect cities that maybe you couldn't do while you were CTO of New York City? Yeah, I, I think um, it, particularly with MasterCard, there's an interesting opportunity to not just um, take advantage of this network of cities and the the public-to-public -public collaboration or public-public partnerships, but I think MasterCard has the opportunity. What I saw, the reason I'm excited to be there is to bring together the private sector partners also, and so to create this um, critical mass of of resources and interests and objectives to really help move the, 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 the priorities forward, right? So it's the traditional resources and that sort of thing, but again, being able to go beyond our inventory of assets and reach into the, the partners uh, that we can assemble, I think is gonna, it would have been super valuable to me as the CTO of New York, so I'm expecting it will be very valuable to the CTOs of cities that I, that I know today that we'll engage with and, and those that I'll come to know in the future around the world. Yeah, maybe you guys can expand a little bit on how do cities work together today? Like how does Chicago talk to Amsterdam, talk to New York, talk to London, talk to Helsinki? Um, let's start here. Sure, so I was the CIO of Chicago for a little over six years and I think the way cities work together is changing. Um, there's, you know, I think there was always 
a lot of informal collaboration at, at conferences or even just the occasional phone call of, I'm working on this project, have you done that? What can we learn from each other? And that was always helpful, but to be honest, it was a little bit limited. Um, so about, did we decide it was four years ago, yeah. Miguel? Um, there was a group of, of CIOs in the US that, that then eventually became global um, that got together and said, we actually need something more formal. And so uh, a handful of us, including um, those of us up here, got together and formed a group that actually worked together on um, everything from you know standards and sharing how we were hiring people, best practices, and even down to sharing code on certain projects. Um, and while many of us have actually moved on, that, that structure has remained for the people who have replaced us. Um, and now you're actually seeing even that become more formal into programs that are supported by, like we partner in a program with the United Nations that's bringing 20 cities together to actually talk about the projects they're actually implementing and how they can become peer partners from the developed world to the developing world to share what they're doing and accelerate work around smart cities. Um, so the way that cities can work together um, just between themselves can range from informal, just phone call to phone call, to very formal programs supported by like the nonprofit sector, or like Miguel was saying, you know, projects supported even by the private sector. Um, and then what we're doing specifically is, I think, even just another model where we bring multiple cities together to focus on a very specific problem, whether that's traffic congestion or flooding, and define the set of requirements for a solution required to that problem, and then help corporations and academics, acad academics there we go, invest in, in that solution and bring it to fruition so those cities can implement it. Because um, cities are, are facing the same problems, um, but those really tough problems actually require usually more than one partner to solve it. So and, there's and multiple I, models that range from the informal to the very formal. And I think when we formed the council, we were intentionally just the city CIO, CTOs working together, and we really put a, a barrier between us and the private sector, um, mostly because we viewed the private sector as the vendor community, and those are two different things, right? And so I think there was, there was a reason for it that I think was valuable, but we also did ourselves a disservice to some extent because we were lacking the, the engagement with the private sector that was valuable to the to forwarding the discussion, right? And so, again, and, and then in my role now, I think it's an opportunity to to engage from the private sector capacity without coming to the conversation with the vendor name tag. I'm here to sell you something, but rather to engage in an authentic partnership and discussion with the cities to surface what those issues are, and then figure out the best way to work together to to help address them. And at times, that will involve a vendor or a solution that gets bought and sold, but, but it's changing the way the conversation begins that I think is a, con a contribution to what Brenna was describing in the question you asked before. I think the most national, natural partner for the city of Helsinki has been the Finnish state for ages, and then of course some private companies and some NGOs and so on. We are just now uh, finishing the recruiting process of our first CDO, Chief Digital Officer, and uh, I don't think the Finnish state or the private companies in, in Helsinki can help him or her that well to get started than other CDOs, CTOs, CIOs around the world. And I think that is a small but really concrete example where we really have a possibility to gain from the experiences of other cities and networks between cities. A partnership that seemed very formal, at least from the outside, was after Donald Trump announced that the U.S. would pull out of the Paris Climate a, a Treaty, a lot of cities in the United States announced that they would try to uphold the targets that they'd set. And here you have a network of cities you know, entering into essentially an international agreement. Um, I'm curious, you know, it's great that cities are taking that initiative to get there, but we are talking about technology here. Um, how are we going to get there? What are cities doing to fight climate change? So just a European city to do so. Okay. Um, well, I, I, I would say when what you see in every every big challenge, basically, I, actually, I think cities used to be crap at collaboration. I mean, we, we used to have collaboration departments talking to each other, basically, and 
but on, on, on a field of interest, people weren't collaborating together, actually. So I think we're making a big step in that perspective. Um, um, and also on the field when it comes to climate change, obviously we have all types of networks where cities already took the lead, I mean C40 and everything, I mean Helsinki obviously is a leader in that as well. Um, and, and I would say, I mean, most cities do have uh, uh, pretty ambitious carbon ambitions, basically. On the other hand, though, I mean, you should realize that on this, it, it's, it's a city level, but that's a regional level, basically, you want to do stuff. Because, obviously, like New York just published a plan that they said, hey, when we put a solar panel on every roof, we would come to 3.2% of the electricity we're going to generate sustainable. That's not enough. So we do need more, basically. So cities need to get aligned, basically, and state what they need from national governments to do so. But the cities need to organize themselves to do so, because it's going to happen in the cities. Also on that example, so it was one thing for cities to band together on principle, right, and say, we are going to uh, collectively commit to forwarding these objectives. It's another thing to actually move that into action. And I think cities are also much better at that than, than nation states, frankly. And so in, in, on that topic and specific to New York, we launched an NYCX challenge in New York specifically on the, to, ex, to figure out how to accelerate the deployment of electric vehicle charging infrastructure. But that, part, that, launch, that uh, challenge was launched in partnership with Paris. So the press release that came out of New York City announcing that launch included a quote from Mayor Hidalgo of Paris. And they were participants in observing the, res, the respondents we got. They committed to allowing the winners to demonstrate their uh, technology on the ground in Paris and vice versa. So we, a couple things happened. We elevated the profile and the objective of what we were trying to achieve. It wasn't just New York, now it was New York and Paris. So we also got respondents from different places. All of a sudden this was a story or this was news in France. And so they were looking at New York where previously they might not have and vice versa. And so I think that's also the power of when you get cities together, they can actually act and act pretty swiftly. That whole deal was put together in, in weeks. It wasn't some you know multi-year long di you know uh, discussion about um, philosophies and politics. We got down to the business of of doing the work, and I think that's what cities are good at. So when you when you add to that the collaboration between cities, then that's a that's an accelerant, right, to that to that action. So we went from agreeing to with to to um, support the goals to taking action against those goals very very swiftly. One more example on how cities can actually go from the policy commitments to action. Um, so when the U.S. cities stepped in to meet the commitment of the United States, when the Fed stepped back. Um, it was actually, so Chicago became the host city for the North American C40 Summit in January. And so all the mayors were coming together to basically, we're supposed to define the roadmap to those goals. And there was a concern that, no offense, that the mayors were going to um, state the commitments to the goals and there was going to be this lack of underlying detail of how they were going to get there. So there was a decision made that the day before the mayors were coming into town, that a day would be spent with the chief resilience officers, the chief sustainability officers, and the CIOs and CTOs would come together and spend a day to define plans like what happened in New York um, for each of the cities to build the detail of that roadmap. And so there was a day spent, and we were, we were lucky to host that at our offices. It was great to actually watch all of these workers come together and actually create the detail that would support the policy commitments that the mayors were going to be making um, and to watch all of these North American cities come together. So one of the things that cities can do, to Miguel's point of that very specific example, is create those detailed roadmaps. Um, and, and have the ability to facilitate those partnerships, whether they're just in North America or crossing borders over to France, and elevate that. Jan, you set a goal of 2035 carbon neutral in Helsinki. Did uh, your you know, team freak out about that, or how, how are you going to get there? Yeah, that's true that we have uh, quite ambitious climate goals to reduce emissions by 60% until 2030, and then to be carbon neutral at 2035. And as we all know, it's much easier to commit yourself to different kind of goals than really to take care that takes place. But in Finland, we are like dull guys in that way that if we promise something, we also take care of it. We have a quite fresh action plan of remember, 140, 
three actions or something like that we need to take care of during the coming coming 10 years and uh, very concrete ones uh, i happen to be the, the former energy minister in finland so i, I more or less know the the, the 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 sector but it's roughly we are talking about three sectors traffic uh, energy efficiency of buildings and then energy production very very concrete actions you need to take during the next coming years and there once again if we if, when we want to benchmark when we want to get the best practices we don't get them from the private companies. We don't get them from the states. It's other cities around the world who are tackling the totally same issues and same questions. And in some case, we have the best case in Vancouver and in some other case in, in Amsterdam and in a third one in Copenhagen. And instead of trying to create your own solutions to each and every case of those, you really need to have a, a good collaboration between cities. An interesting thing is that you see the private sector is helping in that perspective as well. I mean, <clears throat> a reason for, uh, let's say, data centers to be based somewhere, basically, nowadays, is not only uh, tax reasons, but also, hey, do you have enough sustainable energy? Is there energy enough? I mean, do you have different networks, etc. So, I mean, uh, I think private sector pushes us to do so as well, and that, that, that actually is a good thing. I mean, uh, it's, it's a competitive advantage nowadays when you have uh, renewables, when you have a resilient system, and, and, and that's totally different than 10 years ago again as well. So, I mean, I mean, it's rewarded as well in that perspective. And you see that cities start to compete in a nice way on, on resilience and on sustainability. And this is actually quite good. So let, let, let mayors and civil service break uh, against each other about, hey, we're going to do even more because we're going to do this. So it's a nice, nice form of competition that works very well, I think, uh, along the world. I'm glad you said data centers because it makes the segue a little easier, which is, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the dreaded Internet of Things, dreaded or much anticipated Internet of Things. Um, as cities get smarter, as there's sensors and everything, as cities are collaborating more and sharing more data and to getting more data about their citizens, we're obviously creating uh, either cybersecurity risk or you know these these buckets of data that as they become more and more interconnected, they need to be protected in some way. So. I'm curious, uh, especially like when you look at the you know consumer side of the Internet of Things, we have baby monitors getting hacked, we have you know smart fridges not working, things like this. Um, a, how is the Internet of Things being used right now in cities? And B, how is data being protected? And what is the happy medium there? I'll just kind of throw that out to whoever wants to take I mean, it. A great question, obviously. I mean, when, uh, what you see right now is that I mean, up to now, basically, sensors being put in cities actually basically pretty much by default. I mean, you just put in some stuff, and there's not too much regulation about it. There's no regulation about uh, transparency about who's gathering data, when, wherefore. I mean, where's the data stored, etc. So and then you have two types of networks, I would say: public sector, which cities put in place themselves, and well, most of the time, there's a bit of thinking behind that, basically, uh, about privacy, about security, etc. But obviously, you have a lot of private sector networks being deployed in cities as well. I mean, every uh, supermarket nowadays puts in sensors. Every taxi company is gathering data the whole time with their cars driving around, etc. And what you see right now is that a, a lot of cities actually, uh, uh, well, we do this together with New York and Barcelona, we actually start to think about, hey, what will be the rules for people to deploy networks in your city? I mean, what algorithms actually do we allow to be in our city? I mean, is the algorithm stealing? Is it discriminating? Is it actually transparent and open? Do we know what's going to happen? Do people actually know what data is being gathered? And I think we've made a tremendous step not talking about, only talking about privacy anymore, but we're now talking about human rights. I mean, people have the right to know who's gathering the data from whom, what's being stored, etc. We were not going to stop this. I mean, I mean, well, we live in a digital world. I mean, data is, it is a driver for prosperity and for next steps, etc. But you want to do it in a decent way. And then well, we're at the beginning of, well, uh, inventing the framework to do that well. But I think this is typically a topic where it's actually collaborate quite well on. Right. So when you're working with a private company that, uh, you know, is collecting data about citizens or uh, traffic data or something like that, how do you, do you want to make sure that that data stays in your city or close to your city and isn't mixed with, say, you know, uh, the data of people across the world or... You know, how should that data be stored and protected, or, and is that taken into account? Well, real quick, I think separate from the 
the storage and management, I think Kara might have some specific ideas on that. But to lead into that, I want to kind of add to the question, which is, I think it's a matter of identifying the value of standards, right? I think um, this IoT space or this smart city space is still the wild west, right? There's not a lot of structure to or standards to how this uh, how these systems should interact with one another, the data how it should be um, defined and and kept and secured and organized and made available or not made available. I think we're in the early days of a much needed phase of establishing standards globally for how those things um, produce and uh, and how we manage the data that, that comes from them, both for the purpose of security w that you're alluding to, but also, frankly, for the purpose of productivity. To, m to make this valuable to multiple use cases, uh, it is, it's important that this stuff be interoperable and, and exchangeable. And so that's going to come from establishing some set of standards, which goes back to the original premise of the power of collaboration of cities is to get together to talk about what those standards should be and let the customer, in this case, or the, or the, the, the owner being the cities, really have a, a, a front seat or the primary seat in that standards discussion so that we establish it in a way that, that cities at critical mass can agree to. I'd like to take one step backward. Um, the city of Helsinki has a open data policy since some 10 years ago. We decided to open all the data we have. I mean, all data. There need to be a really good uh, legally binding reason why not to open some data. We did not that uh, for commercial purposes. Even if we have today understood that it creates a lot of commercial opportunities, we did it because we think that the biggest strength of the Finnish society is trust. It's trust between people, and it's trust between people and the government. And in, in order to have that kind of trust, in, in order to, to enhance it, and in, in order to, to keep it in, in a complicated world, you have to like drive a policy where you show each and every day that you have nothing to hide as the government. And that's why we really think that the, the transparent way of, of handling our governments, which we do in, in all, more or less all Nordic states, is a really, really big asset. Then, a little bit later, we understood that it, it's also actually the best way for, for empowering the citizens, the uh, best tool for co-creation, and today we also understand that, that it creates a huge amount of business opportunities. But, the, the, I mean, the, the basis is trust, trust between people. Data privacy is a very tricky and difficult issue, but I think that in countries where you have trust, trust between people and the government, the data privacy is not as tricky an issue as it is in some other countries. Actually, to be frank, I mean, and Helsinki, well, is a benchmark for that, actually. We, actually, nine years ago, we copied your open data policy one-to-one. Uh, -one. Finnish is a bit hard to understand, so we translated it first <laughs> in English. But um, um, yeah, seriously, just try to speak Finnish for a while. I mean, you really well. But um, <laughs> um, uh, it's fine. But we actually copied it basically. Then we copied the open data store. Nowadays, we're in the next generation of it basically. But the interesting thing is, uh, and one of the starting points also in Finland is that you, I mean, trust is not something you, uh, as a government, you write down. Do trust us. Trust is something you should earn. That means when you do these things, it's it's not and you should do it fundamentally. So not pragmatically. Oh, let's open this today. Let's open that tomorrow, etc. It's a starting point. Hey, we want to be transparent and open. And uh, example, given the same discussion with Miguel last week, on hey, when we collaborate with Mastercard, which we like to do, and which we like in general. I mean, there's a tremendous opportunity in, in collaboration. The only way to make that work is to do it open and transparent, and not uh, uh, tell people and them. So hey, we actually we make all types of decisions from the black box. That's called database, uh, uh, um, uh, which is stored somewhere in the world and managed by somebody. And algorithm is, well, doing stuff. Um, doesn't work that way. I mean, for governments, it's transparency absolutely is key in everything you do. So you need to have transparent uh, 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 sources of your data. Actually, citizens sh should have the opportunity to access the same data as well to know what's the data we base our decisions upon. And secondly, I mean, you should be as transparent as possible in how you use it and who's using it, and etc. So the only, it's trust is something you should earn and not something you only put on paper. I want to add one sort of nuance to the discussion, which 
is actually all elements that I agree with, but one of the challenges that I think all cities face and that we've certainly faced in Chicago is we've introduced our first IoT privacy policy around a, a sensor network that we've put into the city called the Array of Things. Um, and as we, one is as the city of Chicago introduces more sensors into the right of way and also as more private sector companies introduce solutions into the city that frankly the city of Chicago as a government actually at this point has no control over, right, the supermarket sensors, et cetera, is many, and I would say most residents in the city of Chicago have no idea what data is being collected by those networks. Not the public ones, because the city of Chicago has taken a really proactive role in going out and educating the residents about what these, the public sensors are doing, what data it's collecting, how they're going to use those data, because there's a, a strong commitment around that, that public trust issue that you described. That's a small sliver of the sensors that are in the city of Chicago. All those other sensors are private sensors, to your point, right? The supermarket ones, the security cameras that are on private buildings. Most of our residents have absolutely no idea what data is being collected about them, how it's being used, and what rights under like Illinois state law they may or may not have to do or say anything about that data or the use of that data. So we actually spend a fair amount of time attempting to bridge that gap and to kind of update the discussion that's going on in Chicago. Right? The digital divide used to be around like internet accessibility. The IoT digital divide is a chasm I think like we have never understood before. And that's creating a, a, a very deep concern among at least some of us in Chicago around who the haves and have nots are going to be as data becomes like the currency of the future. Um, so I would just sort of add that to say as we think about the the advent of IoT, or however you refer to it, that, that the privacy conversation becomes more complex when you think about those people who, frankly, the relatively small and well-educated sliver of people that are going to understand the value of the personal data that's being collected about themselves and the people around them, and those of us that aren't, um, because the algorithms using that data are going to be or are so complex. Yeah, and when we talk about open data, I mean, you think about the data that Google has or Uber has about traffic patterns and things like this worldwide, globally, and you look at cities that have tried to regulate Uber and Uber says, we're just going to leave your city. So is there a mechanism that cities can use to, A, obtain the, some of that data that might be helpful in city planning and things like this from global companies, and B, is there a way for cities to band together to say, hey, you know, Uber, you need to share this sort of data, uh, you know, across the U.S. or across Europe or, or globally. Absolutely. I mean, this is what's what, what going to happen. I mean, we, we, we need to learn a bit how this would exactly work, I would say, but mobility is a great example. I mean, we've been collaborating for many years with, with TomTom, the navigation company, on, hey, who actually is responsible for traffic management? I mean, it used to be the government who said actually we send signs, go left, go right, and we need uh, traffic lights, etc. Uh, but nowadays we're just one of the players in the whole system of navigation throughout the city. I mean, who's responsible for air quality? Who's responsible for um, the, the uh, where you put down the traffic when there are schools or elderly people wasn't crossing the roads, etc. So you, you, you need to play a new role, basically. And one of these is that actually we think we should have access to data that's being gathered in public space for public use. So, um, um, so this is basically a policy right now. It's not by law, but actually every company I speak to understands the concept behind this. When you gather data in public space, your data is more or less should be open, obviously on the aggregated level, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, for public use as well, because otherwise you would have a bit of a strange situation in your city that I mean you lose control of traffic. I mean, it will be everywhere, and, and, and your air quality uh, uh, issues are uh, uh, going through the roof probably. I also think taking a contentious position with government in terms of your relationship is a very short-sighted business strategy. So Uber right now, or historically, might have had the leverage to say, well, we'll, we'll leave your city, and that will be of detriment to your city. That, that is shifting. That, there are alternatives, number one, and there, are, there is a, a renaissance of business understanding the value of a healthy relationship with government especially in this space where the, the need for access to infrastructure and the need for access to data is bi-directional. It is not just, oh, the government needs data from Uber. The government has data that would serve Uber also. And so, and it's not to 
necessarily to pick on them, although that's always fun. easy fun. Yeah, an easy one. Easy. But, but it's true. I think the, the, the private sector players who understand the value of a strong relationship and role of government in your product development cycle, is, uh, those are the ones that are going to thrive in this space going forward. And the ones that can't wake up to that are going to struggle, I think, in going forward. Also, ask a different type of government, and a government that actually knows how to collaborate, yeah. knows how to play its role, etc. I mean, historically, we're not very good at that. I mean, again, Helsinki is a great benchmark for that. If, if one country, Finland, uh, and one city is, is uh, has been growing for the last 20 years in public-private partnerships, it will be Helsinki, I would say. I mean, uh, uh, in Europe, you're a benchmark in that perspective. We have also understood already for a long time ago that we are a quite small city and a quite small player and that the public sector is not the best innovator and we see the role of a city as we write in our strategy that it's it's primarily not a bureaucracy or an actor it's a place a community and an enabler and just to give you an example we have a a city-wide uh, uh, air quality sensor network created by the, the, the city together with some private companies. And the model itself and all data is open. We can use some information, some data for, for I mean, own purposes, but the idea for us is, is to try to create Helsinki as a lucrative test bed for any companies all around the world to, to come and take use of the, the information we are providing. And we see as, as our strength is that we are, we are like big enough to, to, to create uh, opportunities for innovations on systemic and scalable level, but at the same time small enough to make that happen. No, no, actually, no, you're absolutely right. And it's also, uh, uh, and this is what I mean, especially you know, on, on the national level in Finland, is very uh, impressive, is that you also try to make, well, not even traditional roadmaps, but also put a joint view, well, uh, 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 what we are working towards, basically, when you talk about, like, example, given the fields of sustainability and mobility, I mean, uh, Helsinki is leading in terms, uh, in the field of mobility as a service, where you create a data platform, well, actually, you go from A to B, making use of all modalities, public transport, uh, shared car shit, bikes, whatever, basically. But the question is, who owns the platform in that perspective? Who owns the data that goes in, and how are you going to make sure data is being opened and transparent to everybody because otherwise we probably would have a company popping in buying the data and with a year you would have a monopoly and if one of the things we've learned well example given to telecom networks in the United States that the monopoly doesn't really work for the quality of your networks so uh, you want to have a decent form of competition and the government needs to play a role in making sure there's competition I want to talk a little bit about equality and distribution of technology um, we've seen various cities implement pilot programs where you know one neighborhood will become smart and it's generally an affluent area that gets you know the fiber connections and things like this and I understand that there needs to be you know you need, these things need to be tested out in certain places but how do we make sure that this technology is rolled out equally within cities and then as we're talking about global collaboration how do we make sure that you know New York City is not America's only smart city, for instance, or how do you make sure that Helsinki and Amsterdam are not the only smart cities in Europe? We are. <laughs> I know, I know. I think, I think that uh, it goes back to the power of the collaboration between the public sector and the private sector. I, I think you can't blame the duopoly of telecom in the, in the private sector for-profit um, uh, obligation to go after the places that can afford to pay for the service. That, that's their business model. That doesn't make them evil people. It might make them not great community actors, but that's not their, that's not their written statement or, or objective. But when you have a healthy relationship between that and the government who does have a social kind of equity objective, then you start to balance that. And that's, again, the point of, of uh, the, the importance of this public-private relationship beyond just a transactional partnership. And so in New York City, for example, we intentionally focused our early experiments on Brownsville, Brooklyn, where there was significant disadvantage. To do two things, to make progress in that neighborhood 
and but also to prove to the the kind of commercial side of the equation that you can do good and do well at the same time, and that is just good business over the long term. Basically, back to the point I made about the the data sharing. Like if you have a strong relationship with government, and if your products can also not only drive profit but drive social impact, then that's the best of both worlds. That creates, I think, real value that's durable over time. I think you should push it. I mean, it needs leadership as well. I mean, I mean but fiber is a great discussion, actually. I mean, in Dallas, we collaborate pretty intense with the five biggest cities nowadays, uh, and this helps quite a bit to telcos, to the national government, actually, to stop a few of these discussions because the whole idea, if you need fiber, yes or no, I mean, we're talking, no, of course, we need that, dot. I mean, stop the discussion if you need it. Everywhere, deploy it everywhere. And so you don't need it to, and, and then the private sector, no, maybe we need to create a bit, we don't do fiber, we do copper, copper upgrades, etc. No, just stop that bullshit. Just deploy fiber everywhere. And then, yes, your profits will be a bit lower within the next year and the year after. But on the long run, everybody sees that this is the way forward. And I do think we can expect from private sector to take a bit of responsibility uh, to involve everybody in these things, basically. And otherwise, we just need to make regulations. That's what we did with the first telecom networks as well. You should connect everybody in the whole country on a network. I mean, we deployed a, 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 a copper network in the Netherlands in five years, a, a gas network to, uh, for a, a natural gas in every household in eight years. And there was, a, well, in eight years, the whole, whole country. And now, yeah, maybe do a bit and do a bit of this. No, come on. But I th and I think that's, sorry, I think that's echoing what I was saying, which is... I'm always we, echoing we, you. Uh, <laughs> no, but the point is, you're right in that we should expect that of the private sector. But the government has to engage in the conversation. We can't expect the private sector to miraculously develop social consciousness all by itself. It has social consciousness, especially in tech, I believe. But how to deploy that, how to exercise that social consciousness, requires the government to help direct, and vice versa. The government needs to know what questions to ask and what expectations to have of the private sector engagement. So all of this, just to continue to underscore that the partnerships are, what, are how we're going to drive this forward in a in an equitable and still profitable, AKA sustainable manner. Like we also have to have some sustainability to these social impact goals. We can't just, it's not all charity, right? It's gotta have a business model under it that can continue to drive reinvestment and, and continue to move those things forward. And that's how the, the, the two parties play an important requirement to the collective conversation. Um, Finland is a, young and used to be a quite poor nation and we found out already some time ago that our only actual natural resource is the human capital, our people. And that's why we decided to put a special emphasis on education. And we are, I think, best known for having the best schools in the world. But to be honest, we don't have the best, best schools in the world. We have the best bad schools in the world. So I mean, the average level of our schools is the highest in the world. It doesn't mean that the best, best schools are in Finland. But I think that that is actually a quite clever policy and a good philosophy. And I think the same goes for everything and also for the smart city issues. It's not about some, I mean, uh, internationally breakthrough technologies and solutions. It's also a question of them, but it's, it's a question of the average level of the organization and of the whole society to, to be able to live in a, a di digital world. In today's world, I mean, we can't start everything by, by city-wide experiments. It's just impossible. And th that's why we need uh, smaller pilots and demonstrations and so on. Uh, and there we need the private sector. But then we, when we find out that this is something that's really working, then it's a question of political commitment. Then it's a question of the government to take care that that will be rolled out through the whole city. I, I want to take, I'm going to, this is maybe a little bit of an abrupt segue, but the political commitment, I, I want to recognize the mayor, right? People like us have been sitting on stages like this for a while talking about this, and we haven't had, week. and we, yeah, and we haven't had the mayors engaged at this level, and we, we saw that yesterday with the roundtable we had uh, with some, some U.S. mayors and um, the mayor of Prague involved in that discussion, so so I, I really want to underscore that. It's important to have leadership here to that point of political commitment and to ha and 
And the stuff he's describing is the big stuff that matters and trying to figure out how technology and innovation or whatever can help forward those, um, those ambitions, those goals. That's what people like us have been waiting for, is for someone like Mayor here to be on stage with us you know, uh, thinking about these goals the same way. So thank you very and much for doing that. And actually, it's about also about making it less political in a certain extent. I mean, one of the, uh, the uh, let's Copenhagen as an example. I mean, in their sustainability targets. I mean, it's not even a political discussion if they are going to go uh, uh, down in their CO2 emissions within in 2025. Actually, they want to be carbon neutral. I think that's not even a discussion. The question is, how are we going to do this, basically? That's political, and who to tax more, and who to tax less, etc. But not that you're going to do it. The, the education in Finland is not, I mean, everybody understands they're going to invest in education. That's not a political thing. How are you going to do this, and, and who's going to pay for it? That's the political discussion behind it. And that's the right discussion. So you agree on the targets through all political parties, basically, and then have the discussion about how to do this instead of if, and then, all right, this was your idea, so we're going to do it differently, we're going to do, well, well we're not going to do uh, education, we're going to do health because we're a different political party. No, it doesn't work that way. This is a long-term commitment. You need to make it less political, but real political leadership. Right. I think uh, we have time for probably one last question, so if you'll indulge me. Um, we talk a lot about competitiveness, uh, you know, on a global scale, competitiveness between cities. Often in the United States, what that means is uh, especially yeah, high on the list. Tech. Yeah, high on the list. Yeah, yeah, high on the list. But also, when like right now, there's a competition for Amazon's new headquarters, and that's like who wants to give Amazon the best package and things like this. So, um, what does it mean? What does competitiveness between cities mean to you guys? And you know, do we have to get out of this mentality that there is a competition between cities and sort of look for something that's a little bit more sustainable across? Personally, I think the competition between cities should stay in two places. The economic development, people trying to compete for the Amazon headquarters, and sport, right? Because we all want the championship team. Um, in the tech world, it, it's not. I mean, you, we have, those of us on this stage and many in the, in the council that Brenna mentioned that we created, we went, we've gone beyond sharing ideas and best practices or lessons learned. We've gone so far as to, act, to share actual access to code, actual access to policy that's been written. So I, I actually think that's this whole phrase of the superpower of the public sector is this opportunity, ability to collaborate, is one that is fairly uh, unique and very strong to the public sector that has been not taken advantage of as much as it could have been historically. But what, you've, what you're seeing up here in, in this conference in general and conferences like this all over the world is a recognition that in order for cities to accelerate and enough to keep up with the to the keep to catch up and keep up with the pace of change in tech, we have to work together to get there. There's and there's no way you're going to do it and from scratch independently on your own. And with regards to the Amazon example, I mean, that's a bit more in that perspective, I would say, because I mean, I like to compete with every city in the world about going for economy and football, if you wish. But um, um, uh, but but the real issue in that from Amazon is that actually. You see cities changing the rules only for that specific company to come to them because it's more or less blackmail. I mean, it's like we get every uh, job in retail in your city we soak to ourselves, basically, and we're going to deploy 50,000 people somewhere else in a city in the U.S. So actually, I mean, it's a bread and butter of a lot of people to work in retail, basically. So they need to uh, uh, um, compete in these things, basically. And they're going to change the rules just for one company, actually. And cities allow themselves to have a competition about, hey, who can be the most flexible in the rules we have? And actually, uh, a disadvantaging existing small and medium entrepreneurs that are already in the city because they do need to pay tax. They need to have all uh, comply to all the rules and regulations, etc. So I, I think this competition is, is shows that cities actually should say at a certain point, no, of course not. I mean, you can come to us if you want to, but we're not going to bend our rules because you blackmail us. All right. Well, I think we are out of time. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, the panel, for being here. And. Uh, I'm around afterwards if anyone wants to talk, but I think, will you guys be around as well? Cool. Well, thank you. <laughs>